Okay. Okay, it is July 31st, and it's Wednesday Bible class, and we are picking up in Revelation 22. Actually, we'll be picking up in verse 10, because it kind of is a stopping point, or a starting point. Verse 10 is a starting point. But I just wanted to review 9 real quickly, because we kind of hurried through it through the end of the last class. So verse 9 said, But he, the angel, said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. So we see that Yohanan was looking at uh, the one who was revealing all of this to him. And even though he'd been told before, we find him falling down in worship. Now, did he really intend to worship someone other than God? No, that's not his intent. But he's caught up in the moment and he's just so overwhelmed that he... he the worship's just oozing out of him. But notice how careful that angel was to not receive any of the glory unto himself. Pass that glory on to where it belongs. And that even is a lesson to us. When we see the Lord use us, it fills us with his joy. And we want to be used by him. And when someone tells us that, what a blessing it is to hear that. But we all need to realize that's God in us. It's not us. And pass the glory on to God. I have a dear pastor friend who says that he collects the compliments that someone will say, especially after a, a service. He says, I, I clap them like a bouquet of roses, and then I let them go like balloons. Oh, oh, that's but that was beautiful. But don't give credit where credit's due. That's Pastor Alan Rosenberg, for those of you who know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, Patty knows that sermon hard and well. <laughs> and it awesome. fits. Yes, yes. And the Lord's keeping him going, thank God. So, um, so anyway, we worship God, we worship God alone, that's where our worship and our praise goes, but we understand, oops, and that reminds me, are all cell phones silent? Aha, I did remember. Mine says so. And we're in the teaching, so I can't stop, but everybody pray in your heart for Barbara right now, I have no idea what happened, but she's not going to sneak out with not talking to me afterwards, and thank the Lord she's here. So, good. There goes another cell phone. <laughs> okay, we just started with verse 9 and now into verse 10. Because remember, Yochanan has just seen this whole, what it's taken us almost four years to talk through. He's been watching that unfold. You can imagine how overwhelming. Not only because he's 95 AD trying to see things that are far beyond our comprehension. You know, look at our science fiction movies and how crazy they are out there and then as we approach and get close to things we begin to see how things aren't so wild and crazy not that i'm saying it's going to be like our science fiction movies god's beyond our minds but my point being you know, he i totally get why he was just full of awe and amazement and fell down in worship but that worship belongs to god it belongs to god alone the one who is uh the all in all for the prophets they got the word from God, the same as Yohan was getting it. For those who keep the word, that was those in Yohanan's day, that's us. And we're going to see as we close Revelation, which just happens to be the close of what we call our Bible, that there are guides and promises to us again also in this book. But we'll get to that. So right now we're going to look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, the angel said to me, he, you know, you are say he, but... We're still talking about the angel that's been revealing all this to him. Don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time <coughs> is near. I like hearing that, but everybody's going to say, yes, Rochelle, but like you just said, that was 95 AD and we're 2019 AD. How on earth is that near? <laughs> well, my only answer to that is with the Lord, a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So we're only on day two in the Lord's magnanimous plan. But the idea behind it is there is something different. It is more imminent now than prophecy before. That can still excite us. We don't have to think, well, it's going to be forever. <coughs> now, one of these days, somebody's going to be alive in the day that all of this does happen, and it could very likely be us, especially with all of the the things that we see bringing it right up to what we know the scripture tells us is going to happen. When we see that in our world, when we hear it on the news, yes, we have every right to believe it could be imminent. It could be today. That time clock will start ticking for the tribulation. Now, why do I say that's different than other prophecies? 
Daniel, Daniel spoke much about the prophecies of end times. He actually gave the huge overall long prophecy that did span the thousands of years that we're involved in right now. But notice what is said to Daniel versus what was said to Yochanan. That's our clue that there's something different. Go with me to, to Daniel's book, to Daniel. We're going to go to chapter 8, and we'll also go to chapter 12. So hold on to the book for a moment. But go to, to Prophet Daniel. That's Daniel. Whoops, I just hit Jeremiah. He's a good prophet too, but I need Daniel. Daniel. Somebody just said it was their husband's name. If I had been the boy that my parents expected when uh, my mom was scared me, that would have been my name. <laughs> but I surprised them. <laughs> okay. At the end, or close to, actually, no, sorry, chapter 12 at the end. But as we're, we're about two-thirds of the way through the book of Daniel in chapter 8, we read in verse 26, the visions, what Daniel's been saying, of prophecy. The visions of the evenings and the mornings, which has been told, is true. Okay? What you saw, Daniel, what you heard, what you saw, what, what the vision that God gave you, is all true. But, I lost my place, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Okay? Hide it. Don't, don't give it out. Don't give it out, Daniel. It's not for right now. Hide it. Okay? Keep that in mind, and now go to chapter 12 with with that same thought still in mind. Daniel 12, and we're going to look at verse 4, and then we'll look at verses 8, and 8 through 10. Verse 4 <coughs> says, But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, hide these words, seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, the knowledge will increase. So remember they, they write on scrolls? I picture that what Daniel's been told is he's been writing feverishly, getting everything down that he's been told, and amazed by the prophecy of what's coming. But now he's being told, roll it up. Don't spread it out. Don't try to figure it all out. Roll it up. It's a secret right now. It's not going to happen for many days. There's going to be uh, many going back and forth. There's going to be knowledge increasing before the end of this time before these words will be prevalent for the time. Well, what do we see happening today? Do we see people rushing, going to and fro, coming back and forth? And how about knowledge increasing? Wow. I mean, I'm old enough. I can see the difference in the generations. And the kids that are following me that are coming up that cannot believe a world that didn't have the internet and didn't have the, the videos and didn't have, you know, all of these I'm trying to think in my mind so I'm coming up with it. The smartphones, you know, all that. I mean, they, they look at you like you're from outer space when you say we didn't have these things as kids. Yeah, well, I, we had TV, but... No, color. But, oh, color. Well, yeah, I remember when we first got a color TV in the home. And, yeah, I do remember that. I was pretty young, but I do remember it. But the, the, all of these things that I'm talking about have increased the knowledge, have they not? Yes. At my fingertips, when I'm studying the <coughs> all. I'm not limited to just the books that I love that I have in my library, but at my fingertips, I have the world of knowledge. I have the Jewish Encyclopedia timeline of all time. I used to drool when I was a little girl, hundreds of dollars, and think, oh, Lord, bless me with that someday. And now it fits on two CDs, and you don't even have to get the CDs. You can just go online and get in for free. <laughs> knowledge has increased. We know a lot more. We are able to understand more in the sense that we've gone through this book of Revelation, and we've begun to say, hey, we can see how the mark of the beast could be. We can see how one could have world control. We can see this. We can see that knowledge has increased. So what Daniel was told would happen, has happened. Keep in mind he's told, hide it, conceal it. Go down to verse 8. And verse 8 says, As for me, Daniel is speaking, I heard that I could not understand. I said, My Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? This answer, not the answer I want to hear. And any of you ever asked the Lord, and he said, mm -hmm, not for you to know? We don't like that answer, do we? Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. Um, 
I've lost my place, sorry. Many will be purged, purified, refined, <coughs> but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Daniel, it's not for you. You're not going to get to know and understand. You're not going to see it unfold. It's going to happen as we go down the line. There's going to be wickedness. There's going to be wicked people. They're going to continue doing wicked things, and they're not going to have a clue what's going on. Did he just watch Channel 7 News at 11 o'clock last night and report? Is that not fitting for us today? I mean, this is cutting edge. That those who have insight will understand. Has God given us insight through our study of this book? Do we begin to feel that we understand what's happening in our world around us because we have something that's a roadmap, something that's guiding? You know, I make a great wandering Jew. <laughs> I will get lost very easily. Turn me around and I can get lost. I love that I can pick up on my cell phone a GPS signal and get myself out of trouble. Now, sometimes it's crazy and wild and, and hairy and it doesn't always work, but overall, that can get me out of a tight spot. It's a great roadmap. But when I need to know and understand the world around me, this is my GPS, God's protective system. He's protecting me by guiding me teach me, having me walk with my eyes on him. But wow, what a roadmap. You open up that Bible and then listen to the news. It will also keep you from panic. If I did not know what I know from the word of God, I would be scared to death for Israel. I'd be scared to death for the United States. I'd be scared to death for my loved ones. I wouldn't want to see little ones being brought into this world because it's getting so bad. But I don't have to have that negative outlook because God's given me insight. And I know that even until these things are, we have one who is guiding our every step, who is our GPS, who if we stay in tune with him, will get us out of the hard places, will turn us around when we need to be turned around, will put us back on the right track when we get off, but will keep us on the right track if we don't deviate also. How wonderful, how wonderful. But now hear the difference. Daniel's told, hide it, seal it, you're not going to know, you're not going to understand. And you know, even Daniel, our man of purpose, prayer, <coughs> and prophecy, gets told, mm, it's not for you. So here's one that you would say, wow, you know, this giant spiritually, surely he'd have favor with God and God would give him the info. It wasn't for him. He didn't need to know. It wasn't for his day. Now, do you notice the difference for us? We're not told any of this as we go back to Revelation. We are told, study it. We're told you have a blessing if you study this book. We're told that it can be understood. The book of Revelation was never meant to be an impenetrable puzzle. It was meant, yes, we have to study. Yes, we have to dig. Yes, there are certain areas that we can't say, okay, this is exactly like this. But the overall... Do you all have a great outline of what's coming in for this world? Yes, you've got a good understanding, don't you? If you don't, I failed as a teacher. <laughs> but because of our times, it is understood for us, and we are blessed <coughs> by hearing. Because, again, I don't panic when I hear certain things going on. I know God's in control. God's got a plan. They're Amen. working into God's hand. And what a difference that makes. That's a blessing. I'm not in fear. I'm at peace. I'm at shalom. So I trust that you are also that realize when it says the time is near, it is at hand. That does mean it is imminent. The very next thing on God's plan is the rapture and the tribulation. And even if you don't believe the rapture as I do, the tribulation is the next thing. I mean, it's just right there. But because I've given you much scripture to prove it, I believe you also have that peace and security of knowing we don't worry about those days coming on us. We're not children of the night. We're not caught by surprise. We are children of the day because we are in the light of the Lord who has us in his protective hand and calls his bride home before he pours out that wrath. Amen. So what a blessing. Yes, amen. Thank you, Lord. But uh, we do know this is what is 
coming next. And why would we get excited over that? Well, yes, we feel badly for those left behind, and we should be out getting the testimony out and witnessing to them to try to prevent as many as possible from going through it. But it has to come. Why does it have to come? Can't God just change his mind and say, oh, forget it, you know, I won't, I won't bring that wrath on this world? No. You know what? He can't. And you'll say, well, wait a minute, God can do anything. No, God is holy. A holy God can never just wink at sin, can never turn an eye to it and say, oh, I'll just forget that. We'll sweep it under the rug. No, his holiness would not be there. He is holy, he is fair, he is right, he is true, and he has the right to judge because he is the creator of this entire world and of this entire planet. And what a magnificent plan. But because he is holy, because there is a point when sin has to be judged, yes, it has to come. But, hallelujah, as he always does in scripture, when you go through and see the judgment, what do you also see? grace of God, yes. the victory in the Lord. You see what comes out of it. And when we see the passing of the tribulation, what do we see? We see what God planned from the beginning. Heaven on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We see the glory of the Lord in his return. We see the victory over Satan. We go a little further and we see Satan put away forever, never to trouble again. We go a little further past that into an eternity that amazes us, that we have barely a glimpse and we get so excited we can hardly wait. And I hear a pastor on the radio this weekend, I told you how uh, the theory that had been brought to me of how maybe God will take people off of this planet as it fills up with those who are praising him in eternity future. I'm talking all the way over here. And put them on another planet and have that planet populate and be praising the Lord. And as we go through what time is no more, but go through, quote, time, we would have all of these planets with praise to our magnificent, ineffable majestic God. And then I hear this pastor say, do you know that there are 8 billion planets up there? And I think, oh my word. And you say, Lord, we can't measure the heavens, so I know if they've already found 8 billion, there's that many more probably beyond it too. And can you just begin to see and hear them all praising the Lord? Can you imagine a world of utopia no sin, no death, no sorrow, no pain, no sickness, and everybody in love with the Lord. Everybody worshiping him, everybody rejoicing, everybody in a hallelujah state. Okay, now how do we wait? <laughs> I'm sorry, but how do we wait? This same pastor also described, I think it was he, maybe it wasn't, but I liked this also. He described heaven. You know, our eternal home is not here. And it's not just a place done well here. It's beyond what we have here. And we know when we get into eternity future, we have no clue what the Lord has planned for us. But he described, or whoever this was said, heaven is a perfect place of perfected people with our perfect Lord. I like that. I like that. That's where we're headed. Thank God. We've gone through all the horrors of the tribulation. We've gone through the curse of sin. We've seen the evil. We've looked at it up front and personal because it could be people we know that will go through that. And I'm so thankful that the Lord goes on and gives us the glory of what he wanted for us from the beginning. He gets the final word. He wins, and we do with him. So, unfortunately, even though everyone will not believe, we go back to Revelation 22. We go to chapter uh, chapter 22. We go to verse 11, and we see what is the response. And sadly, this is. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. The one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness and the one who's holy, 
keep himself holy. What's being said? Remember when we just read in Daniel, and in Daniel it was said, the wicked are still going to be wicked. It's going to go on. Even with a roadmap like this to tell us, even with people being missionaries, even with the prophets through the centuries, even with everything around that speaks and attests to a majestic creator God who has put a plan in motion, even seen by the scientists who want to say there is no God and yet see the order of the universe and cannot explain how it stays in that perfect order. Evolution, yeah. Take, take your watch, take all the parts out, throw it up in the air, have it come down and be a watch, and that's about as good as what evolution can do for you. It is not, it just comes together. We know that. The only way it's a big thing is like Roger Shirt said, God said it and bang, it happened. <laughs> Outside of that, no. But even with all of that, man's desire to put himself on the throne of his life keeps him from admitting there is a God with a master plan. And we have what is said here. Those who are unjust, those who are doing wrong, those who are doing unrighteousness, they continue on. Do you remember when we were in the throes of the tribulation, getting to the worst points where the worst of the worst was being poured out in quick succession just before the end? And the people cried out. They didn't cry out for salvation. Do you remember that? They cried out blaspheming God. They cried out with a hardened heart against God. Remember those two substances, one clay and one wax put in the light, the light being the light of the Son of God, one melts and one hardens. Even in the midst of seeing that there is a God they need to answer to. And wisdom would say, hey, if he's bigger and he's got control, maybe I want to get right with him. And instead, they continue on as it says here, doing wrong. If they're filthy, they are still filthy. Even through all of this, we see overall, man does not change his heart. He stays in that unrepentant, hardened heart against the God of love. And he basically chooses wickedness. Sadly, that is the commentary that we see. The character tends to be fixed. It is very hard to change. We know that. We know what you're raised with. It's hard to change when you're older. We know if you have habits. Habits are very hard to break, so you need to watch the habits before because I'll give you a good Jewish proverb. A habit is something very hard to break. If you take away the H, you still have a bit. If you take away the A, you still have a bit. If you take away the B, you still have it. And that's how hard a habit is to break. <laughs> so watch the habits you form. Form habits you want to keep. Don't be caught up in a world of wrong. Don't be caught up in rebelliousness. Don't be caught up in a heart that is not soft and tender, where the Lord cannot penetrate and change you where you need it, because all of us are in that constant need of change as he perfects us from faith to faith, on that walk till we get home with him. Thankfully, he never gives up on men like me. Um, Matthew showed us the state of the wicked. It's, it finally is too late. We see that. I'm just going to remind you quickly. I'll look at Matthew 25. Okay, well, let's see if I can get... There we go. Okay, Matthew chapter 25. We're not going to go through the whole chapter by any means. Whoops. Matthew 25, there we go, oh, okay, I'm having a little tablet trouble, let's try Matthew 25, so we say all this technology and then we have this happen, we want to go back to the good old days, right? <laughs> okay, Matthew 25, verse 10, I'll read verses 10 through 12, remember the first uh, parable that was given where the virgins, five were wise, five were foolish, five were ready, five were not. This is what happened in the end. While they were going away to make the purchase, to buy the oil because they weren't ready, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other versions also came and said, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you don't know the day or the hour. Be ready is the whole idea behind that. Remember, we're not talking.
talking about uh, that you can lose your salvation, that we are talking about those during this time will show that they are in tune with the Lord by their actions. And they have to be ready, and we apply that in the same way now, to go home with the Lord now, if he calls for his, those who are his, in the air and says, come up, if you're not ready, you don't have time to go get ready. You don't have time to go buy. You don't have time to go do anything. There are those who say, oh, well, I'll hear or I'll see it start, and I'll say real quick, save me. Well, <laughs> if you're up in the clouds with the Lord in the twinkling of an eye that science still really can't even measure, is so fast, how do you get those words out? You don't get Lord out. You don't get save out. You don't get me out. You can't get one of those three words out before it be over. So, yes, we can apply the be ready. We don't know when the Lord's coming because if we're on this side now, we don't want to go out and pleasing to Him. We don't want to go out without being doing what, what God gave us to do. And for those during the, the, uh, this time, the Lord's return will be sudden also, and those who are not ready, who have not opened their hearts to him during the tribulation time, will not go into the millennial kingdom, instead they will be cast out. So there is a point where time is too late. There is a time when the door is closed. Someone went to a crusade once, and they saw, um, it was the last night, and you know how everybody waits for the last night, and then it's, everybody <coughs> wants to go. And it came to the point where the stadium was full, and they closed the gate, and they wouldn't let anyone else in. And the person that was on the inside, seeing that gate closed, and seeing the people on the outside looking like they wanted in, and he said, that made me realize how important it is to get people saved and inside now, because that day will come when they're cut off. And you don't want to be in heaven saying, wow, oh, if I'd known it was going to be so great, I would have told so-and-so. Just know it's going to be that great. Get out and tell them, okay? All right, so back to Revelation 22. It's still in verse 11. And okay. and we see that we that those who are continuing on in their way, and often it's hard to change people, but God, and maybe I should say the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, can bring change in the heart that will let him that we have those who are still doing wrong, doing it, those who are filthy. Filthy, the idea is foul. Your manuscript, your, your version might say be made filthy, but really it's a continuation. They're still filthy. Maybe they're getting filthier, but they're still filthy. It's not that they made a change and gone back. It's that they're continuing on. Okay? Let the one who is righteous, do you see the contrast? The filthy, the, the ones doing wrong, versus now the righteous, what is righteous? Is that not God's nature? Yes. God is righteous. How are we righteous then? By his blood in the Messiah, in Yeshua Jesus. Yes. Look at Romans 3, 21 and 22. Whoops. Romans. I've got to get to the right book first. Romans. Romans 3, 21 and 22 is what we will look at. Sorry, maybe this will pick up or I'll start doing better. It might be on me. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. The law was a guide to teach and to show if you don't have the law, you don't understand right and wrong. And that's why we say never does God throw out law. There are those who say, oh, we're not under law, we're under grace. Yes, overall, we are saved by grace. We're not saved by keeping that law. That's very true. But does that mean that we can go kill now and we can have it, we can steal, we can, you know, just throw all care to the wind? Of course not. We know that that's still God's righteous standard. That's a holy standard. That's what we should be always trying to reach, that standard. And now that we have the Spirit of God within us, He can enable us to reach a standard that we could not before. So apart from the law, the righteousness of God is manifested. It's witnessed by the law. It was witnessed by the prophets, by what they said. They spoke about God. Remember, they were God's mouthpiece. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. You know what it's saying? No distinction? It's not for just the rich. It's not for just the, the, the okay, well, rich and poor, for the famous. It's not for those born in 
the United States only, or in you know in the palace. It there's no distinction. It's for everyone, given freely to all. The price paid by Yeshua Himself. That's how we become righteous. Is in that shed blood. We are taught to do righteous, which means we're to live according to that holy standard. We are taught to to um, try to attain holiness. There are those who teach that we can be holy. I'm not one who agrees with that, but it's certainly the goal. And we don't, oh, well, I can't get there, so it doesn't matter. No, I want to be closer to it today than I was yesterday. I want to please the Lord more today than I did yesterday. I want to be useful to him more today than yesterday. That's what this is telling us. Those who, who don't care, who go on in their filthiness and in their sin and in their, what was the other, filthy and um, wrong or unjust. They, they continue on in that, which would mean then if we are the opposite, what are we continuing on in? In our becoming holy, in, in our <clears throat> working to please the Lord. Our pastor said the standards, just look at the Ten Commandments. That's God's standard. Yes. That we should follow. Yes. Yes. It is absolutely God's standard that we should follow. Absolutely. He, whoops, I did the wrong chapter. I'm not doing good with my tablet today, and I guess it is more me. There we go. Okay. Uh, yes, if you if you don't know the commandments, how do you know how to please the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. It is how you don't know the If you don't listen to the commandments, then you don't know you don't know what. True, true. And being holy means to be set apart unto God. It means to be, in, in essence, I'll say it this way, we're to be made holy. That means we're in that process, and we know only the Lord can do that in us, and he's doing it. Just like those who work with um, precious, uh, um, like gold, you know, the, the, oh, what's the word, but they are, you know what I'm trying, metals, thank you. And they're forming something. If they're a china painter, if they're, you know, doing something, they put it into the fire, into that kiln, and that fire takes dross out. But one time in the fire doesn't do enough. I've got a friend that said on some of her plates that were the most beautiful, it was four or five times of firing because each time a little more would come out, a little more would come out, but each one, each layer, each level had to be that it worked with also. It wasn't just that, that you just go back in and back in and back in, but there had to be this process. That's what's happening with us, and that's why I encourage you to remind you, if you're in the fire, it's either a fire to correct you, and you'll know it if the Lord's telling you he's correcting you, or it's a fire just to, to get that dross out because the Lord wants to conform us to his image. And they watch as they work, and, and I've heard for those that, that, not the one that's put it into the kiln, that when it's um, on the outside and they're working with it, that when they see their reflection, that's when they know it's done. When the Lord can see it, his reflection in us, then we'll be done. We're under construction. Yes, some of us need a lot of construction. Still. We're trying. <laughs> okay, so here is what's going on again and again. I went to Revelation chapter 3. I don't know why I'm having such trouble. Sorry, everybody. Let me get back to 22. It went to verse 22, but chapter 3. Come on. Okay. Revelation 22, and we're still, we're actually probably ready for the uh, 12th, and I've got to see it today. Uh, yes, because still keep himself holy. We have talked about that. Okay, so here we go again. Verse 12, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Behold! <laughs> are you awake? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? There's our behold again. <laughs> okay, behold. And what does he say? I love it. I'm coming quickly. Do you want the Lord to come back? Yes. Yes. Then isn't this music to your ears? He's coming quickly. Okay, he is coming. It's talking here at this point of, of the second coming because we know it's not talking about the rapture. It's talking with all these, what we've been talking about, the end of time. We know that we're talking all the way through. We're not talking back here. So he's saying that he's even ready to come quickly at the second coming. Well, we're seven years before that, so hello, it's coming. And then he says, my reward is with me. Uh, oh, and, and even when I took you to Matthew 25, the sheep and goats judgment, 
uh, I'm sorry, I took you to the virgins, but it goes down to the sheep and goats judgment. We know that's all talking about the second coming to come to set up his kingdom. It's not talking about rapture, and we know that, that when we talk about being with him in eternity, that's over here. So he was focusing at that point, reminding them of his second coming. Um, and, and when you read Matthew 24 and 25 in order, keep that in mind. By the end of 24, you see him coming back at the end of the tribulation. And then 25, you see who goes into the kingdom. It'll help you keep on track through those three parables if you keep that in mind. So now, with all that in mind, he says, my reward is with me. Ooh, reward. We all like that word, don't we? <laughs> okay. Whose reward? He's our reward. Yeah, he absolutely is our Lord. And he is the one speaking. Our Lord that we love is the one saying, My reward, Messiah, is the one who is speaking. And he is the one who is to be the judge to give out those rewards according to how he sees that it is right. How do I get that? Well, he says it's my rewards with me to render to every man when we read the next phrase. But let's go look and see. Does scripture tell us that? I thought God's the judge. Hmm. Let's find out which one. Okay, go to Yochanan. Go to John chapter 5 and verse 22. Yochanan, John chapter 5 and verse 22. We'll read 22. I think we, yeah, we read another verse in there also. Okay, John, Yochanan chapter 5 verse 22 says, For not even the Father judges anyone, that he has given all judgment to the Son. Well, okay, Jehovah God then has turned judgment over to God the Son, Yeshua, Jesus. Look at verse 27. And he, God, gave him, Yeshua, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now, if God chose to judge apart from Yeshua, Jesus, people could say to God, that's not fair. You weren't human. You don't get it. You don't understand. You don't know how hard it was. You don't know how much that hurt. You don't know how my heart was broken. What right do you have to judge me? What do you hear when you go to jury duty? The one on trial has a right to a jury of their peers. Who can relate? I'm not going to go sit on King Abdullah's jury because I don't know how kings live and what they should be judged with. But I'm certainly going to be, in fact, I was once because I've been a teacher in the school system. I was on a jury that was judging a case for a teacher. I said, I might be prejudiced. They said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they were right. She had no case. <laughs> the point being, God handed it over to the one who does know how hard it is, how much it hurt, how blinded they were by circumstances, how this, how that. The Lord went through it all for us. He suffered in every way. That doesn't mean that he had to experience every single little thing that we possibly could because how could one person in 30 plus years of life? But did he hit in every category where he can relate? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. No matter what it's touching, it'll fall into three different categories, part of, of life, um, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. Sin will fall under one of those three categories, bless you. And as the Lord, even when Satan came up against him in that temptation that you read about in Matthew 4, it came against each one of those categories. And as he passed the test in his humanness, because that's what was on trial, God, we know, can never fail, but the human part had to show that it passed the test. He had to live perfectly to sacrifice his blood for us. Can he relate? Yes. I told you the story before, the woman that was watching her little son dying of cancer. How sad and how hard, and her heart being ripped out, and any mom can relate in a split second to that. And in one of her moments that where she was just at her wit's end, she was crying out to God, and she said, God, you never had to watch your son, and before the sentence could be finished, she realized, oh, yes, you have. You watched your son die. Yes, you know how I feel. 
nothing we can experience in this life can we ever say, Lord, you don't understand. Yes, he does. That's why he's the one that it is right that he judged us. Or not us, but these people at this time. Okay? He has that right. We do stand before his bema seat also, though. That's when we're in heaven and we stand before him because we're in heaven. Are we standing there to be judged for salvation? No. no. You wouldn't be in heaven if you weren't saved. If that wasn't a fact, you crossed that line into heaven. Nobody's going to get in and, oops, you don't belong. You're kicked out. No. <laughs> you're in. You're in. But you're standing there in heaven for your rewards for what you did for him. So that you have jewels. You have these crowns you can give back to him. You have the robe of righteousness, like I, my mom used to say. And I know you've all heard it, but i, I got to bring it out again. If the robe of righteousness is what our acts for the Lord in what we've done through his power. Some may be up there with mini skirts and some with flowing robes. We want a flowing robe, okay? You want to be doing right. We want to be doing for the Lord. We're going to want to give back to the Lord. So yes, we want those rewards. So even though this time here he's talking about judging at the second coming, we still know we stand before him in judgment also, just for far, far, far better reason and not to have our sins brought out. I am so glad God took my sins and he didn't even just bury them. He washed them away and then he, he put up a block where he doesn't remember them. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm embarrassed over my sins. I don't want to remember my sins. I tell him, I'm so sorry. Please just take it away. Thank you. He did take it away. <sighs> and as Corey Tim Boom says, when God, well she says he buried your sins in the deepest of seas. And then he put up a sign that says, no fishing. So don't go fishing back out and hold yourself to task. God's forgiving you. Let it go. And if Tom shows up to remind you of your past and to try to trip you up that way, remind him of his future. And when temptation comes knocking at your door, who do you send the answer? Exactly. Don't go thinking, oh, I can handle this. Hey, Lord, doors for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to Romans 2.16. That's close to John. Just a little bit further. I can probably get that faster in my um, Bible so that all the pages turn and bother you guys when you listen to the tapes. But I'm not ready to pick it up and use it someday. <laughs> Romans 2.16 tells us, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Messiah Yeshua, through Christ Jesus. Bringing this out because I want you to see, once again, even though God the Father turned the judgment over to his son, God and the, the son are still one and the same. So you're still, in essence, the judgment comes from one throat, from one. Because we know, remember how we can't, inter we, we have to intertwine who. You know, we see God the Father, we see God the Son. Oh, but wait a minute. We said that about God the Son. We said that about God the Father. Which one is it? Remember the scarecrow? <laughs> well, we know. And so I bring that out to you to realize it's not that God's up in heaven and oblivious. And it's not that he's a God so far out that he can't relate to us. He created us. Remember? They were both involved in the act of creation. And he created with such wisdom, such, I mean, wisdom doesn't even say it. It's just awesome. It's just amazing. Yeah. But he also, in that, in that wisdom is so far beyond us, yet, let me give you the example of the man who was out, he had large fields, and he was out studying. As he studied, his gaze went across to his field of watermelons, and he saw these huge watermelons growing on these tiny little vines, very fragile little vines. And then he looked up and he's seeing all the trees and he was sitting under an acorn tree. And he sees these tiny little acorns on this big tree. And he thought to himself, hmm, God, why did you put the big watermelons on the fragile little vines and the little acorns on the big tree? And about that time, an acorn fell off the tree and hit him on the head. 
And he suddenly knew the wisdom of God to put the watermelons on the vines on the ground and the little acorns on the tree. God is awesome. He is far above our thoughts, our ways, anything. About the time you want to tell God, why didn't you do it this way? Think about the acorn hitting you on the head. <laughs> it might stop you from saying something. Okay, Acts. 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 Okay. We're going to this one. I think I've given up on that one. We are going to Acts, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 10. See, one doesn't like the books, and the other doesn't like the chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Acts chapter 10 and verse 42. This is where my mind's racing and saying, we think these things are so great that, you know, our kids are saying, oh, they're amazed that we grew up without them. Well, I'd like to get to the next generation where I don't fight them and they work well. <laughs> okay, Acts 10 verse 42 says, Then he commanded us to proclaim and attest to the Jewish people that this man has been appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, God again appointed Yeshua because he lived the life. These Jewish people are saying, wait a minute. And he's saying, no, this one lived under your law. That Jewish law, he came, he lived under it, he kept it. He has the right to judge. Again, we're just seeing both. We're seeing God and we're seeing the Son in that judgment. Go back to Revelation on your way back. Stop at chapter 19. Go ahead and go on back to... Uh, Yes, Revelation 19. Come on. Okay. I think I'm really out of that one. Which limits me now to my Bible? We'll see how we do. Revelation 19, and we're going to look at verse 11. <clears throat> Revelation 19 is the coming of the Lord out of heaven to stop the battle of Armageddon. 11 says, I saw heaven open. There before me was a white horse sitting on it, was the one called Faithful and True. We know that's the Lord. We talked about all that in time. And it is in righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. Okay. The righteous judge is the one who judges. And in this case, we see it being the Lord. So, going back to chapter 22 now, and uh, verse 12. No, yes, yes, we're in verse 12. Okay. Okay. In 22 and verse 12, oh. now we are seeing that, uh, okay, I've got to switch to a different version here. My rewards are with me, okay? My being Messiah, who was acting as judge, his reward in Greek, it says, my wages. What do we earn when we do a job? We earn wages, wages, don't we? That's the idea behind these rewards, but has been earned. In this case, when they stand before him to be judged, whether they go into the kingdom or not, they're going to be judged by whether they did good and righteous works or whether they were doing works of evil. That's where we're off the hook in our judgment again. We're not judged for, did you do right? Did you do wrong? We're judged through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus because none of us can ever do enough right to equal God's holy standard. And if we're short of God's holy standard, we're out. That is just, it's just all over. The, um, Jewish rabbis who have studied the scriptures say there's 613 commandments that have to be kept. Scripture says if you break even one of my commandments, you're guilty of it all. It's an impossible standard for a human to keep apart from the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus keeping it for us. And he's these rewards that he's got that he, he's giving in this version, it says my rewards are with me to give to each person according to what he has done. Um, I think I use the word render in the other uh, version. Render is giving back what they deserve, okay? I'll render to you. I'll measure out to you what you're deserving. And notice it's according to the work that they have done. Again, we're not talking about salvation. You can never earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift. We know that. But what you do after you get saved, that's what is going to be measured back to you. They're going to have to prove during the tribulation time. They're going to have to prove by their works what's in their heart. Mm -hmm. They're going to, to lose their lives very often for doing the right thing. They're not going to do that right thing when they know it's going to be the cost of their life if they don't really have the Lord in their heart, if they haven't become kids. So their actions are going to show what has happened to them. We say it this way. 
by your, their fruit, you will know them. And we are told we can't judge, but we can be fruit inspectors. If you don't see fruit coming and you don't see it ripening and you don't see it being good, you can question. Okay? And question for the right reason because we want to help them get on track. The concern is those who think, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I live a good life. I was born in the United States. That makes me a Christian, doesn't it? Well, if you were born in the garage, does it make you a car? <laughs> we have to each one personally ask, but we don't want people to miss heaven by 18 inches from the head to the heart because they know all the facts. Even the demons believe in Jesus. So someone who, who says, oh, well, I believe in Jesus, that's still no guarantee that they know him in their heart. Because even the demons will say, I believe in Jesus. They have to. They know he's real. They've seen him in a way we haven't even. But again, what, what they saw or what the Lord judged depended on whether they went into the kingdom or not because it was showing their faith. Okay, And the kingdom was the sheep going in because they did. When we, we read it in Matthew 25, about verses 29 to 34. You can read the whole area around it on your own, but just remember in, in just brevity that it says, um, when I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was sick, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they're saying, Lord, when did we do that? We didn't see you sick. We didn't see you thirsty. We didn't see all of these. And he said, even as you did it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Now, he's saying that at a time when he's of Jewish race. Because Yeshua, Jesus, honored was Jewish. That's the nationality he was born with. So when they did it to save the Jewish people, who the attack is going to be coming against, they did it to his brethren. I also bring you the second layer. When we become a child of God, we become his brethren. So it's also for the believers. Mm -hmm. Who are the two groups of people that Satan goes after, especially at the midpoint, Revelation 12, that he turns his wrath toward the women who gave birth to the male child, who we know was Messiah, mm -hmm. and to her offspring, the description, to those who keep the, the testimony of God and the... <coughs> Yes, it's the Jewish people and it's the believers. What's the second phrase? Revelation 12. I just drew a red one. Um, it's Revelation 12, 5. Um, it's the two groups there. My goodness, I'm drawing a blank. I'm putting them together too much. Uh, okay, sorry, verse 17. 5 is where it starts. Verse 17, it the dragon was angry with the women, went to make war with a remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God. There's your Jewish people who are trying to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua Jesus. There's your believers. So we see it in, in the two groups there. That that is what is being referred to here in Matthew 25 in that judgment. Now again, are, is anyone, look at the people who helped save Jewish people in the Holocaust. By far and large, when it got down to it and it was going to be they were putting their lives and the lives of their family on the line. Only believers were the ones who would step up to the plate to do that because they knew they were giving their life. That what they would lose here on earth, they would gain in heaven with the Lord. He gave them the ability to even do it. We see that in that. There are many people who will live a good life. There is a cult out there that does many good works. I'm going to call them out. You all know who I mean anyway. Excuse me. But they do good deeds all the time. In their mind, that's one more step toward heaven. One more step toward heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, who would ever be able to say when you've done enough steps? Who would ever be able to say this is enough? Who gets to judge that? God is the one who judges. And he put out his holy standard and said anything short of holiness is short of heaven. Why? If he allowed even one sin into heaven... Heaven's now ruined. It's no longer heaven. Now sin's in there. That brings in death. That brings in sorrow. That brings in grief. That brings in horror. Even one sin, I would want to live forever in heaven. That God keeps it perfect. Nothing crosses into heaven that is not his standard 
and holy perfection. Hallelujah. And that's where we live forever. I'm going to read to you very shortly here that he stopped Adam and Eve from being able to live forever. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yes, I hate death. Yes, I miss those that I love that have gone on before me. But hallelujah, we don't live forever in this state, in this world like this. That would be horrible. That would be my worst nightmare. That would be my nightmare on steroids if I had to live like this forever. But to know this is just in time, a drop in the bucket compared to the time of eternity, which is no time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the grace and the mercy that did not sentence us to this forever. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, right? Okay, so verse 13. I think we're ready for verse 13. I am the, okay, I'm in a version that's hard for me. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Um, the Aleph and the Tav, if we're talking Hebrew, Alpha and Omega is Greek. In English, very good. A to Z, first to the last. That's what's being said, okay? That he is everything. He's the beginning, he's the end. In actuality, he's before the beginning and before the end. But you get my point. Because remember how nothing on earth can be up on his level. So he is the first and the last, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega. He is the source. He is the finisher. He is the creator. He is the consummator. This shows eternality. It shows the eternal nature of our God. Now, even though you've heard it before, let's look at that in a little bit of detail. Go back to chapter 1. Anybody remember chapter 1? <laughs> just, just a little bit ago, right? Chapter 1 and verse 8. What do we read there? Okay, now, in chapter 22, who's speaking? Jesus. Good. Okay, we've got Yeshua, Jesus speaking. He's the, the judge. He's coming back. He's going to be back with reward to give to those. And uh, um, it goes on from there. So we see that it's Yeshua Jesus speaking in chapter 22. Now, in chapter 1, we have again the same thing. I am the Alpha and the Omega. It says, Adonai, God of heaven's armies. In our Hebrew, Adonai Sabaot, God of the, the host of the heavens. Okay? So doesn't chapter 1 sound like God saying it? And chapter 22 sounds like Yeshua Jesus is saying it. Do we once again see? They're one. They're one. There's no way to separate. They're one. The son, the, okay, the child we know was born. The son was given. Because we call him the son of God, you cannot think of it this way. That's our humanness. Oh, here's dad, here's the son. No, you've got to bring them right up to the same level. He, even as son of God, is eternal God, the God of eternity also. And in fact, in Yeshua, Isaiah 9, 6, when it gives all the descriptions that you know very well and you love it at Christmas time, uh, everlasting Father is the Father of eternity in that phrase. And that phrase, each one of those phrases, is describing the Messiah. Right there, it's in that one verse even. Look at verse 18. And chapter 1 is a great description of God the Father. Oh, but wait a minute. I see God the Son. Yes. <laughs> Verse 22, did I say? Did I say 22? Where did I go? 18. 18. 18. Thank you. Verse 18. I got 22 in the brain. The living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. So verse 8, we have, and we decided that's God speaking in verse 8. He's God of heaven's armies. If it's calling him God, we've got to say he's God. And now in verse 18, we have him being the one who came and was dead. But look, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys to death and shall. Well, isn't it the son that says that? Yes. So again, if I had to choose and say, I couldn't. You can't separate them. They both, they're, they're just, they're both it. They're, I don't know how else to put it. They are both it. And I want to bring you to, um, let's go a little bit at the creation now real quick. Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 44. I'll try to get that on the track here. Yay, it works. Isaiah 44. Isaiah chapter 44, and we are going to look at verse 6. Isaiah 44, 6. I 
Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. So we see the word Lord doesn't guarantee us that we're talking about the Lord Jesus, because here the Lord is God. The King of Israel is the Lord Jesus sitting on his earthly throne and is the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Adonai Sabaoth, we just saw was God the Father. So in one verse, we have both being described again, where we really cannot separate them. Can we totally understand this? No. 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 To be just brutally honest, no. If you say you got it, we're being Daniels. We're being Daniels. <laughs> Lord, I want to know. I want to understand. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, look at chapter 48. Stay in Isaiah. we just go to chapter 48. And we're going to go to 48, and we're going to go to verse 12. Yeshaya, Isaiah 48, verse 12. Listen to me, O Yaakov, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I call. Okay? God, we know, speaks to Israel that way. We hear it all the way through the original covenant that you call the Old Testament scriptures. I am he. I am the first and the last. Okay? Alpha and Omega. All of to top, beginning to end. First and the last. We see the same thing. Surely my hand have found, I'm sorry, surely my hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. What's this one claiming? I created the earth. I created the heavens. I put my hand out, and the heavens were made. We know that at one point he says he flung the, the stars out in space with his fingers. The stars are just his finger work. <laughs> wow. When I doodle, it doesn't look anything like what God's doodling is like. <laughs> We see a description here, and we see very clearly the one that, that's, that we're hearing, we see in relation to Israel, is this one that has created. Keep all that in mind, and go with me now to Hebrews chapter 1. Okay? Very good Jewish book. We're keeping that Jewish mind here. We're going to go to Hebrews. And this is not somebody that made coffee. This is a good Jewish book of people. Well, chapter 1. There we go. Hebrews 1 and verse 2 is what I want. As soon as I can get it, I get started and then it freezes on me again. Okay, sorry. It'll take me another minute. I'll do it over here. Hebrews chapter 1. There we go. This one's working. And verse, what did I want now? 2. Verse 2. That's right. Right in the beginning. Okay. But now, in the last days, in our Hebrew, he has spoken to us through his son to whom he has given ownership of everything and through whom he created the universe. Okay, wait a minute. We just read of the God of Israel in Yeshua creating, and now we're reading here that it's his son who created. Do we have a problem now, <laughs> not, not when we realize our goal of the mind. And again, I tease you again and again and again. Wait till you get into the first phrase the first three words, and even the fourth word uh, in Hebrew of Genesis when we, when we teach Genesis next. And you'll see it explode where you have God created and you have the Son created, both in the Hebrew very clearly. So, yes. Oh, thank you. We'll give that one a try. Thank you much. Now i got a third one to contend with. <laughs> so we very much see God created, Yeshua Jesus created. They were both involved in this, and they're both involved in the very end also. When last proof, go to Colossians, because I want you to see, even apart from a Jewish audience, you still have a Jewish writer, because all the scriptures are written by Jewish writers. Um, that you, He's writing to people who are not of the Jewish background in, in Colossians. He's writing to people who live in a place called Colossae. Yes, there was a Jewish nucleus there. Yes, there were Jewish believers in this uh, community. We could call the Messianic community, but there were plenty of non-Jewish, plenty of Gentile minds there. And in Colossians 1, verse 15, the description by Sha'ol Paul, the author, he is the visible image of the invisible God. But we know right from that one phrase one, we're talking about Lord Jesus, right? Yeah. How do we see God? When he puts on a face and steps into space, and we call his name Jesus. Okay? So we see that, that uh, okay, he is the visible image of the invisible God. He is supreme over all 
creation because in connection with him, were created all things. See how it very clearly is saying all creation was by Jesus? Okay, and all things that were created in heaven, on the earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, lordships, rulers, authorities, they've all been created through him and for him. He existed before all things, and he holds everything together. If I only had Colossians alone, I would say Jesus did it all. But I know from Pharisee Genesis, God did it. I know from Hebrews, God did it. I know from Revelation, they both did it. See how we see it in our way? Is that not amazing? Why? Because God is too big to be confined in one. That's just where it's at. This is our, and I love it, ineffable, remember, too big to be explained in one phrase. He is an affable God, the God of creation, the God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amazing. So Messiah was the beginning. He is the source of all things. He is the goal of all things, and he is a consummation of all things. He is it from beginning to end, all to top, alpha to omega, first to the last. We're ready for verse 14. Revelation 22. I can't get this to the here. You give me another one. Oh, and it's on Revelation 22. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> okay, Revelation 22 and verse 14. Although now I've got two of these that are on the same version, aren't they? Oh, the top right. Top right. CJB. And I see it. I see it. Okay, because my complete Jewish one's working up here, so I'll go to the American Standard. Those are the two I like to use, by the way. Um, you get the Jewish flavor from the Jewish one, but you get some more depth from the American. Uh, very close to the Hebrew and the Greek. There we go. I'm ready. Thank you, Roger. Sure. Verse 14, and we'll start to, just with the first phrase. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Okay, I think even in... Um, well, I'm not in the other one right now. I'll get back to it. But I think you're probably all on that same page. There are Greek manuscripts, and that's why I was asking. There are other versions that might say, blessed are they who do his commandments. Okay, okay. Those are the Greek manuscripts that they respect a little bit more. But the idea behind it is one and the same, because the ones who are doing his commandments are the ones who have washed their robes in his blood so that they are trying to be obedient and live obedient lives unto him. We know that the only way to be saved is through the shed blood of Yeshua and Jesus. We know that that is redemption. Let me take you, in case there's any confusion because of the different ways of saying it, let me take you to Revelation 7 and verse 14. Revelation 7 and verse 14 says to us, I said to him, my Lord, you know, and he said to me, Oh, well, i got to back up because you're not going to understand. The robes of righteousness, I don't know what we're talking about. How can it be doing its commandments and, and robe of righteousness? How can they go together? Okay, in verse 13, Yochanan John is talking back and forth with an elder in heaven. Remember the elders represent us, um, the, the what I'll call New Testament believers, for the quickest way to say it right now. So he's pointed out a group of people, and he asks Yochanan who they are, and Yochanan says, I know, you tell me. And he says, these are the ones who are clothed in the white robes. Who are they, and where have they come from? And Yochanan says, I don't know. My Lord, you know that my Lord is a little L. It's just respect. He's respecting this angel that's talking with him. And he makes it clear, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So if your version says they've washed their robes, that's the idea behind those who are keeping his commandments. They've washed their robes. They're living unto the Lord who they know personally through the shed blood of Yeshua and Jesus. Um, on the way back, we're going to back up and we're going to go to Ephesians. I think it's got to be me. When you've got three you have trouble with, I mean, there's got to be one common denominator here today. <laughs> Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have a redemption through his blood. In Yeshua, obviously. The redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins or trespasses according to the riches of grace which he lavished on us. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful word? He's lavished on us. 
Do you feel lavish in His grace? <laughs> Think no further than your salvation to feel that and to know that. So, keeping that in mind now, let's go back to Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation 22. And what's it saying about these people? <coughs> Revelation 22 and verse 14, we are saying, Blessed are those who keep the commandments, who have faith in the Lord. Blessed are those who wash the ropes, who have faith in the Lord, so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Okay, remember I told you we were going to talk about this. Now, the tree of life, where did we hear about the tree of life? Very beginning, a very good place to start. So we go to Revelation... <laughs> We go to Genesis, very sheep. Yeah. Chapter 3 and verse 22. We're going to run back there. We're going to look at what we talked about just a minute ago, so we won't have to stay there long, but it's easy for you to flip from back to front anyway. Revelation 3, 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold! <laughs> That's in the other books beside Revelation. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Behold, the man has become like one of us. Okay, he's talking about Adam, Adam. He's saying, this man has become like us. Is he saying, oh, Adam's now a god? No. And that is a teaching that's out there. It's in a cult and is as false as can be. We never become gods. We become like our Lord through what he does. That we are not, and that's not what it's saying here. But in one way, he is now like God the Father and God the Son in heaven than he wasn't before. And that's where it says it in the next phrase. He now knows good and evil. When God created the dome until he sinned, he did not know evil. Now he knows evil. Okay? He had the test, he failed the test, and there's your consequences. Now he knows good and evil. Thank you very much, Adam. Of course, I wouldn't have done any better. But now, and now, he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life. Okay? Remember, they're in the garden. There is, he told them they could eat from all the trees. There was the tree of life. That apparently is what would have kept Adam living forever, was eating from that tree. The only tree they weren't to eat from was the one of the knowledge of good and evil. God didn't want them to have the knowledge of evil. I wish I didn't have the knowledge of evil. I'd be glad to not have it. <laughs> Eternity coming. Okay. So, he could stretch out his hand, eat from the tree of life, and live forever. So, God says, I, I don't want that. I don't want that for my creation. Thank you, Lord. Verse 24, so he drove the man out, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherry beam and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So, if Adam and Eve had a desire... That fruit was the best fruit. I just want to sneak in and just get one more piece and eat it. No, they couldn't do it. There was an angel with a flaming sword guarding that tree of life that they could not go back and eat from it. But now we're reading about that tree of life. And now in Revelation 20, uh, 22 and verse 14, it says that those who have washed their robes, those who are in the Lord, those who are, have kept his commandments now, they have the right to eat of the tree of life. And they enter by the gates into the city. Where's the tree of life? Do you remember my description earlier in verse in chapter twenty-two, wasn't it? Wasn't it just at the top of twenty-two or was it twenty-one? Right, right. Is that, yeah, there we go. It's the top of 22. In the middle of the, the street on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing the 12 kinds of fruit. So obviously he is talking to people who are heavenly people. He is not talking to earthly people. The tree of life has been removed from the Garden of Eden, from earth. It is found in heaven, near the throne of God apparently uh, now. And so I find that very interesting. We eat from the trees. We know that. We we know we looked at it. It could be symbolic, but it could be literal. So it could be whatever. Excuse me. We know we have the right to the tree of life. Okay? And I tend to think we're really going to eat. Why not? The Lord ate in his new life. He, he didn't need to eat. But when he resurrected, he ate. He ate fish and honeycomb with the Talmudim on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. So... 
You can look at it either way you want, total symbolic or symbolic and, and there. Notice that it's in the, the new Jerusalem that's a part of the new heavens um, in eternity and future, and they enter by the gates into the city, okay? Blessed is the one who can enter. Remember, we saw that they are going to be able to come into the city. We know that's our headquarters. That's our home. That it's like the... It was prepared for the bride, and it looks like the bride, beautiful, but that's our home. There are those who did not ever get to that point. Remember, they're saved during the tribulation period. They missed the rapture. We don't read about them getting the immortal body that we have. We read about them living through the millennium. If they really have the Lord in their heart, living through that time. They passed the test of Gog and Magog. They proved that they had their allegiance to God. And these are the ones that we're talking about that will continue on living like Adam would have done and Eve would have done in the very beginning had sin not entered in. Sin is what brought the consequence of death. There would have been no death. So now here we are to that stage seeing what God intended is what's going to happen here. They're going to be able to enter into the gates. That means that the people of homosexual. Okay? So that's how we see it all the way back into law time. Okay? Uh, 2 Peter 2, 20-22. 2 Kepha, verses 2, uh, chapter 2, verses 20-22. Did I say 2? Good. 2 Peter 2. I did it right. Okay. I'm trying to hurry because I want to just finish up this up. But like I say, I don't want to start this next week because we're, we're going to end on such a <laughs> I just wanted to get it out of the way. Um, verse 20 says, where does it start? Forgive after they escape the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus of Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last day will be worse than the first, for it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment <coughs> commanded to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. Okay, proverb, a saying, a wise saying. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallow in the mire. You all know, you can clean up a pig, but they're going to go right back to that mud as soon as they, you let go. Okay? The dog that goes back and eats what's so close about them, you don't want to stay there. But that's what it's saying. If you've been in the holiness and the righteousness, don't go back to that filthiness of the world. It's telling you to stay away. To that's, You just don't want to go back. But notice the contrast again. The comparison has the word dog in there again. So we see how that's the meaning behind that scripture. Okay, finishing verse 15 without having to look up a million verses real quickly. Let me just get to um, Revelation, there we go, Revelation 22 and verse 15. And I can do this in just a, a heartbeat and you won't miss anything because you really know this by now. So we know what the dogs mean. Okay, the sorcerers. The sorcerers were those that practiced magical acts. They were direct dealers with Satan and with his demons. They would be witchcraft. They would be the drug world. The word pharmakeia comes out of this word in the Greek, the, doing the drugs. It doesn't mean if you take an allergy pill, you're taking a drug from Satan. But if you're doing drugs, yes, you are opening yourself up to that world, to that demon world. That's what all this is. Sorcery is magical acts of the drug world, um, gurus, seances, astrology, astrologists, all of that. That's what would go into this category. None of that is in our perfect heavenly environment. Fornicators, we know what that is. That's the last, that's the less that, that they want that more than they want God. Okay? Not there. All immoral people, those who are practicing fornication, that doesn't mean somebody makes a mistake. As a believer, they slip and they have an affair that they shouldn't. They're no longer a believer. No. No, no, no. God's <laughs> grace covers our sins, past, present, and future. But have they absolutely broken the relationship with the Lord? Yes. yes. Are they going to regret what they're doing? Yes. yes. Are they, do they know better? Do they even feel conviction? Yes. So what this is talking about is people who are practicing it, they have no desire to be in line with God. That's their life. That's what they want to do. They practice it daily. They practice it nightly. 
they're not going to be in heaven. They're not, that's who's being excluded. You want it? You got it. That's your world apart from God in the filthiness of the world, basically, is what's going on. <coughs> Although you know when folks are cast into hell, they're not going to be having their parties and all that either. Murderers are those who destroy God's creation. Remember, even God's creation is going to be lifted from the curse that it's under. There will be no murder, nothing like this. There will be nothing that makes or practices or does whatever <coughs> your, your, your versions read. A lie. Okay, a lie is a falsehood, but a lie, I think, is mentioned again here, and this is the note that we're going to end on. And, and by the way, notice practicing lying. That doesn't mean, again, do I recommend that you lie? No. But if you do lie, you don't have to think, oh no, I've lost my salvation, I can't get to heaven. No, it's not what it's saying. But what started all of this? It started with a lie. God has a pet peeve against lying. Do you want to be, right now, ruining your relationship with the Lord because you lie? No. no. Watch that you do not say anything that is not true and is not right and honoring and pleasing to the Lord. But, again, the point being here, the reassurance we're getting once again, these are never going to come in to our, what our world is, our world with the Lord forever. Our new Jerusalem, even into the earthly that we're reading that there's kings that come up and bring their glory. Even in that world, there's not going to be a lie that ever enters <coughs> in again. I see again God's assurance. It's not going to start all over again. It's not going to be a repeat. Here we know history repeats itself. There, God is reassuring once again. Is this picture so good? It sounds too good to be true, God. And he's saying, yes, darling, it sounds too good to be true. But you know what? It's not, because I said it, it is true. And nothing will ever mar it. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise his holy name. That's the name, the, the where to end. Yohanan, John 844 says that Satan is the father of all lies. Mm -hmm. When you lie and you don't mind lying, he's your father. You're going to have no place in God's heaven and God's eternity if that's who you are. But we know, those of us who are saved, know, we're being given the reassurance. It will never come again. It will never mark. It will never start over. And there's just never. Honestly, I can't comprehend it. A place of living forever. That's perfect. Remember how I started? Heaven is a perfect place of perfected people with our perfect Lord. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Come on, Lord. Come on, Behold. 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 Let's get going. Next week we will pick up in verse 16, but we notice something. It's the Lord. He's talking to the churches. Wait a minute. I thought we left the churches all the way back in chapter 3. Maybe the church goes through all of this. All the way through. Uh oh, I'm going to let you worry about it for a week because <laughs> I know you know the answer. But we'll talk about why the church is mentioned here again, what's going on, what's being said, and we definitely, unless something really derails us, we will finish this wonderful book of promise and of hope, but more importantly, the book of the Revelation. Of Yeshua so come back next week. Don't miss. I don't. I. You know what? Next week's just going to be great because I know the videos that are coming. Don't miss. Don't miss. Move whatever you have to be here. Get the conclusion. And if we don't get themed up off of that, it's not my fault. <laughs> Loretta. I have a special prayer request, and I sort of relate to my nephew, which we're very partnership. He tried to kill himself. He's in the hospital. Remember Josh? Okay. We will in our closing prayer. And here I see the merciful hand of God that kept him from it. Hopefully so that he can come into that right relationship through this. And that's what we'll pray for. Okay. Any questions, comments? Ready to close in prayer? Yes. I'm just like, right now, appreciate the word that we are the bride of Christ. Yes. Because I don't know if in heaven there will be like, degrees of love that we love the Lord more more than the people who are going into eternity future. 
<laughs> because we have experienced sin and we have experienced grace. We know the difference of how much he loved us because we were ugly mm -hmm. and yet he took us. Mm -hmm. yeah, those yes. people are going to eternity future, they're already clean, you know, they don't know sin anymore. Right. So They'll be more like the angels who yeah. are curious, mm -hmm. looking at these people that our God cared so much about that he made this way for them to be able to come to heaven. He didn't do it for the other angels. He didn't do it for Satan. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we are a special people, and we do have that special privilege, yes. If we didn't know hurt, we wouldn't know how great this is. If we didn't know pain, loss, death, we wouldn't know how wonderful that is. We would not know God's grace if we didn't know this. Yes. That's why we have to go through it, yes. Yeah, good point to end on. Any other comments, questions? Okay, we're going to close in prayer. Sorry, we're just slightly over, but we can't tie it up. Oh, Lord God, I am so anxious to go home. And I know everyone else is here too. So, Lord, we thank you. It's a precious and sure promise. We know it, we know it, and we know it. But, Lord, as long as you leave us here, let us, with our breath, with our feet, and with our hands, go out and share it. Lord, send us to hearts prepared to hear it. Prepare those hearts however you have to, Lord. But let us shine for you and let us bring one more home because we know really that's why you haven't come yet is that number isn't complete. So, Lord God, we thank you for giving us hope, for giving us that, that glory to hold on to, but now use us to be glorifying unto you in the time that is left. And thank you that we know it is imminent that we will be home with you. Lord, we pray for precious Joshua, who you died for, who you loved so much, that you did give your life for him. In this state that he's in, Lord, please speak to his mind, speak to his heart, speak to his emotions. Lord God, may he not hear anything from Satan. Every power that Satan has tried to bind him with is broken in your holy name and in your shed blood. And I pray for this precious soul that you loved so much you would have died just for him. We pray that he will come to know that love, that love that can set him free from everything that brought him to that agonizing point of wanting to give his life up. Lord, let him find out that he can have a new life in you, and may he willingly open up and receive you that everything can change. And Lord, we pray, let it even happen today. Be with his family who's going through the hurt and, and all of this also. Lord, give them wisdom, those who know you. Give them wisdom of how to reach out to you this one. And thank you. You know where each one of us are. And you know how to help each one of us no matter what we're facing. Lord, may we walk through our trials in a way that gives praise and glory and glorifies you because that's what we should do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that you are all that we need and we have all of you and we're all in your <coughs> precious name till we're home in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen.